The reading this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barzabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic <coughs> ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. If you have a Bible and have it open at Acts chapter 1, the important thing for us today is that we leave with the thought that this is the word of the Lord. It's not a word of a man I'm only here conveying to you, uh, to myself, this is the word of the Lord. Last week I listened to some ex-sports people speak of a man called Marcus Rashford who plays for Manchester United. And they said that uh, he's not playing well, they feel he's not uh, giving it his all. And what they said struck me, they said that when he came to the end of his career, if it carries on like, he, like he's playing, he will regret, he will have regrets. He will have the regret that he never fulfilled the potential that he had. And these words resonated with me because for each one of us as Christians, we will come to the end of our career. We will come to the end of our life. And today, let me just share my heart at the very beginning. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you will come to the end of life. And if you've never believed, you will realize the tragic mistake. But also as Christians, if God has given you a talent and you're not using your talent, if God has spoken to you about baptism and you've never been baptized, if you are just simply in the fringes uh, when God is calling you, my, from my heart today I say to you and to me is this, our careers will end. Our life will end. And I pray that the Spirit of God will take this series that we're doing called The Gospel Shared, The Church Began, Christianity Spreading, and that God's Spirit will speak and use it to cause us all to realign our lives to God's purpose and for that that needs commitment as Christians. So far in Acts chapter 1, we did chapter 1, verse 1 to 11, where is the first 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. How in these 40 days, he presented himself alive to them after he had suffered. He taught them to go and to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. He told them that they would be his witnesses. And then the Lord Jesus was ascended up after 40 days and the angel said, the same Jesus will come again. And that's how we ended 
the first week. The second week, we looked at verse 12 to 14, which was, we thought on, the th on obedience, waiting, oneness, and prayer. This was them, it was a 10 days, the, from verse 12 to chapter 2, is 10 days of waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And in that 10 days, the 120 that are gathered had a prayer meeting. 120 gathered to pray. I thought it was great the last time we had a prayer meeting that we had 47 at the prayer meeting. There that I am big and counting, but it was a great encouragement to see 47 gathered to pray. They finished that last time with the thought of the word proskar. I should have asked you first. I would have said, look, uh, something, the box is full today, but I've, half of it is out. Proskarterio, which means not to faint, but to persevere in prayer. And since I preached that, four different people, some here, some uh, Christians and other churches, and someone messaged me four different ones of examples of how persevering in prayer brought great results. And I was intending to tell you the four very quickly, but I'm not. And this is the reason I'm only going to tell you one. Is that after Keith preached two weeks ago, and the person's here today, so let me say to the person, I'm not going to name you, I'm not going to shame you, your name, your face is not going to suddenly come up on the screen, so don't panic. But I visited this person, and they said, we really enjoyed Keith on Sunday. I said, yeah, that's good. And he finished at 11.55. And then last week, the service was not long done. And again, I'm not going to name the person. They're sitting here today. And I got a message saying, Brian finished at 12. <laughs> so today, I'll do my best. <laughs> I can't give you any promises, but I'll do my best. Because I'm kind of standing here today feeling pressure. Verse 15 to 25, 26, where Anne read. I intended the last time just to put it on to the end of the last sermon, but I decided then during the preaching to leave it, and I'm so glad I did leave it. Because in here today, verse 15 to 26, we've got four different people that we're going to look at. And also two important truths to take out. And I don't know what you felt as Anne read these words. In those days, Peter stood up. What did you think when that was being read? You maybe just didn't think much. You just thought, well, Peter stood up. I love these words. And I love to think, picture Peter here among the 120 standing up. Now, why do I, why I think it's remarkable verses is this. Is that Peter in his life, he was called as a fisherman, from a fisherman to be a follower of Christ, one of the 12 apostles, disciples. But when you read Peter's life, Peter said things he shouldn't have said. Peter acted in ways he shouldn't have acted. There was times with Peter that he was supposed to be sleeping and he was awake. And there was times that Peter was awake when he should have been sleeping. And in the last moments of the life of the Lord Jesus, each of the gospel writers write this about Peter. That when they came to take Jesus, Peter took off out a sword and each of the four gospel writers, so it must have been something that really shocked them, took out the sword and cut off the servant of the high priest's ear. But then it gets worse for Peter. Because he was there by the fire when the Lord Jesus was in the palace court. 
And when the servant girl came up and said, you are one of his disciples, he said, I am not. And then another servant girl came up and says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth and he denied it. And then the bystanders came to him and said, you are one of these, your accent betrays you. He was from Galilee. It's like we've all different accents here today. This is your accent betrays you. And he began to swear. And this is what he said. I do not know the man. And at that, Peter walked out of Jesus' life. Picture Peter. He's walking out. He's denied him with swearing. And he walks out of his life. There is one thing. Peter may have walked out of the life of Jesus. But Jesus didn't walk out of Peter's life. I love that in Mark, I think it records. When the woman came to the tomb. It's amazing words. When they said to the woman. Go tell his disciples. And Peter. That's one thing that we need to understand today about the gospel is this. Each one of us are sinners before a holy God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son. And the Lord Jesus came and upon that cross at Calvary, he took my blame. He took the punishment. Christ died for our sins. As the hymn says, in my place, condemned, he stood. And when I come and you came and we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we were saved. And we were forgiven. And we were taken into the family of God. As many as received them, to them gave he the right to be called the children of God. Nothing can ever alter the fact that I was born into the family of my dad and mom. And the family, the dad and mom that you had, the family that you were born into. And whatever happens in families never alters the fact that you were born into that family. And that's the same with you and me. We will fail, we will stumble as Christians, there will be low points in our life, but nothing alters the fact that we, despite, our, despite it all, are in the family of God. We are children of God. And when we are like Peter, and maybe there's someone here today and you feel that your life is like Peter, we don't need to be saved again. We don't need to be baptized again. We need to be restored it's like the furniture if you have a piece of furniture or somebody throws it out and it lies in the rain and it just deteriorates the condition but somebody passes it and sees it and they see the potential and they come and you can see some beautiful um, photos of things that have been restored and that's what happened to Peter Peter was restored by the grace of God and the love of Jesus, he was restored. In these moments, and maybe you're here today, and you feel that your life as a Christian, and you maybe feel that, that you've failed. And you maybe feel useless today. And maybe in these, because of things that have happened in your past, you feel that you can just simply hide away, but you'll come to church. As someone said recently that I read, God did not save us to exist in the shadows. Because it's in the shadows that Satan comes and he whispers things about our past and we can be paralyzed with regret and remorse as to our past. And I feel today that maybe there is someone in this church and God is saying to you today that you need to be restored. Restored into the joy 
of that relationship with the Lord Jesus, restored back to a heart that loves Christ and wants to live for Christ and wants to serve the Lord. I'll read this here in a book I bought at Christmas time. I thought it was really lovely words. It was about the pastor of Melbourne Hall, Leicester, Leicester Land. I read it. It's about his 14 years of ministry in that church. As was somebody that wrote him a letter. It says, Dear Mr. Land, you do not know me. Although I sit at Melbourne Hall, I felt I must write this letter to thank you. When I was 17, I accepted Christ and was baptized. And for three or four years, there was none happier than I. Then came the blow. While I was seven in the army, I was injured. My career was ruined and I was discharged. I do not know what had happened, happened, but it seemed as if in trying to build up a new life, I lost touch with God. For two dreary years, he was just a shadow. That is until last Sunday, it was towards the end of your sermon. And even though your words, and, the, and then through your words, I suddenly realized what was wrong. There and then I humbly asked the master to re-consecrate me, to take possession of my whole life again and to do with it as he would. And then the miracle happened, so marvelous I can never hope to fully describe it. The barriers fell and like a great light, the radiant sunshine of the Savior seemed to flood every corner of my heart and the glory of his smile is with me as I write this. We sang that last hymn. Happy day, happy day, and I'm not ashamed to confess that I sang it with a bursting heart and tears in my eyes, for it was a happy day for me. Maybe for you today, the Lord Jesus is saying to someone, I want to restore you. Come out of the shadows and be restored for your life to be lived fully for God. Fifteen minutes in the first Five words, doesn't that bode well for the challenge ahead? But then I panic, don't panic, I'm watching. I just wanted to highlight that point to start with. But then the next thing is with Peter is, is that he speaks of Judas. You can look at it in verse 16 about Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus for he was numbered among us and was allo allocated a share in this ministry. You read about Jesus, Judas, he came, he got 30 pieces of silver to betray the Lord Jesus, and he betrayed Christ. Judas betrayed. Judas is a tragic figure in the Bible. He's left, left there, Judas Iscariot. I remember growing up, and uh, an older man in the meeting used to often tell the story. And it was a story that, from a child that scared me. He told the story of Jock Troop, and Jock Troop was used in revivals as a preacher along here many years ago. And he used to tell the story of a boy, a young man, sorry, who held Jock Troop's hat when he preached. And he used to say, he held his hat, but he says he was never saved. He heard the gospel, he was never converted. He was so close. And that story used to scare me because if you've been around church or you may be grown up in a Christian home and you're in church today and you're not a Christian, be like Judas Iscariot, be a warning. You can be so close and yet never saved. So as Peter's standing up and he's looking around, he might have remembered the words of the Lord Jesus who spoke of the Son of Man is going to sit on his throne of glory and the 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's someone missing. There's a place missing because Judas is no longer an apostle. And this is the first point of two things I want us to remember from today. And it's this. Peter turns to what? For the answers to what has happened and what is going to happen. Look at your Bible in verse 15. Eh, sorry, in 16. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. And there are five different verses that speak of a fulfillment of what happened with Judas. And in verse 20 and 21 is two from the Psalms. May his camp become desolate and then let another take his office. 
So Peter is standing here and he's not saying to the 120, look, this is my idea. This is my plan. This is our plan. What is he? He is saying, this is God's plan. God says, let another take his place. And this is so important for us as Christians today, is this. We have to listen to God. We have to listen to the Lord. Why did the church in Acts grow? And how does churches grow? They grow when they listen to the Lord. This is so important in a day and age today that we as a church, churches today, we, we are going against culture today. I feel sorry for young Christians. They feel sorry, sorry. I pray for young Christians because they're facing, uh, uh, they're living in a world which says everything is permissible. Just do as you, do as you please. Everything. Sex out with marriage, everything. It's yours. Enjoy it. God says to young Christians, he says to us all, he says to us as a church, because I feel today as a church today in 2024, the winds of change are blowing all around us. The clouds are threatening. So many things happening. The church that will survive is a church that listens to God. And the churches that will go down are the churches that won't listen to God. And this is what Peter is. Picture him. He's got the 120. He's holding up the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures. And he's saying to them, listen to God. I was in Edinburgh two weeks ago. And Edinburgh is lovely. But it's a nightmare to drive in. You come in and there's signs that you're fined if you go over 30. There, and then there's signs that you're fined if you go into bus lanes. And then there's, you can get fined if you go through red lights. No, I mean, if you just go through red lights. And after church on the Sunday morning, I came out of church and I drove and I went this way. And Elizabeth gave a shriek because I was going into a tram lane, a tram road. And it gets worse because now, now pedestrians have rights. So as you're driving about Edinburgh, pedestrians just walk in front of you. I was so annoyed and I never toot. I'm there like that, but I toot it. But somebody just walked right in front of me. And then you've got bikes and then you've got Uberoos and then you've got Deliveroos and then you've got cars and then you've got buses and you've got trams. But you know, I drive through Edinburgh no problem. <laughs> and I could take you from A to B, no problem. Then I'd be impressed. Be impressed with Satnav. <laughs> it just tells you, turn right in a hundred yards. And you just follow it. And believers, that's like us. We don't know the rest of the ear in the Lord's will. We don't know our lives, but to journey through life to get from A to B, listen to God. The Psalm 119, 176 verses, read it. Just read three verses a day or four verses a day. Because in it, what you find with the psalmist is this, his love for the word. My heart standeth in awe of your word. Christians, stop today. Does your heart stand in awe of God's word? The psalmist there in 119 says, I rejoice greatly as in your word as one that findeth great spoil. Do we? We need to read our Bibles. And I know it's difficult. I know in the busyness of life. I was listening to Desert Island Discs and it was Delia Smith. I always listen to Desert Island Discs. And I'm going to start using Delia Smith now as cookery book. Because 
My only thing I've ever done is sausages, cheesy turkeys, and beans. But after I read Delia Smith, it'll be different. <laughs> but in Desert Island Discs, at the end of it, normally when, you, when they get the word of God and Shakespeare, sometimes they refuse, sometimes they don't say anything. But she said this. She says, If I was in a desert island, I couldn't think of anything nicer than reading scripture. But she's in a desert island. You're not allowed phones. You're not allowed Netflix. You're not allowed anything like that. We're not like Delia Smith, cast away in a desert island. We're in the busyness of our life. Christians today, take time, each of us, to listen to God. Take time in our churches, listen to God. And that's what Peter is doing. The first point, the second point is on prayer but before that verse 21 to 22 23 they're ready now to appoint someone as apostle and they said the person must be someone that have accompanied us from the baptism of the beginning the baptism of John until the Lord Jesus was taken up there must be a witness or to his resurrection and they put forward two Joseph called Barsabas, who was called Justice, and Matthias. So there they are, they're obedient to scripture, and they've got, they've picked Joseph, and they've picked Matthias. So who is going to be the one that they, is going to be the apostle? Well, what did they do? They prayed. And you've got the prayer here in verse 24, and they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry. They prayed. Church today, can I say to the leadership of this church, there are decisions that we have to make. There are things that we have to face. What is the greatest thing that we can do as a leadership? Pray. What about your life? Maybe you're facing decisions as to job or marriage or service in church or buying a car or buying a dog I don't know what it is that you are thinking about today because life is full of decisions and there are two words here Lord show so the church here the gathered a group of believers have listened to God and now they have prayed and then in verse 26 they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias. Now, casting lots is not something that we do today. We do it if you're playing Scrabble and you're in a fight to see who does not want to go first, or you're playing a game and you've got your hand behind your back, or you flick the coin, or you, whatever way you do it. But here, it is biblical to cast lots, because in the Old Testament, they cast lots. Because it says, they cast the lot, the lot, the, the lot into the lamp, Lamp, but every decision is of the Lord. That's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. You read that in the Old Testament of how this was of God, the casting of lots. But from now on, when the Holy Spirit came, this never took place again, the casting of lots. So there, Matthias is chosen. Before we go up to say, well done, to Matthias, I want to draw your attention to Joseph. How did Joseph feel? It's very easy for us to go up and congratulate the person has just got in this favored role as a 12th apostle. But don't forget Joseph. Why did Joseph not get picked to be the 12th apostle? This is why he wasn't picked. And it's as simple as that. It's not because Joseph was inferior. It wasn't that Joseph wasn't gifted. It wasn't because Joseph, uh, for whatever reason, it was nothing of that. It was simply this. It was not God's plan for Joseph. God had other plans. And maybe you sit here today and things that have happened in your past might have been to do with Christian service. Maybe things that haven't happened in your life that you thought would have been good if they had happened. 
The reason, brothers and sisters, that things haven't happened in my life, in your life, is simply this. Is that God in his wisdom knows what is best for us. And that was the case of Joseph. Well, what about Matthias? The interesting thing in this passage today is, we only read of two of the twelve apostles now, is Peter and Matthias. Well, Peter is mentioned 39 times from here in Acts on, and Matthias isn't mentioned once. What is this saying to us today? Because Matthias was very important. He was, when Peter stood up in chapter 2 verse 11, he stood up with the 11. Matthias was one of the early messengers of the gospel. In chapter 6, we've got the 12 made a very important decision. Matthias was part of that decision. We find that in Ephesians 2, the, the foundations of the church are on the apostles, the Lord Jesus being the chief cornerstone. That's Matthias. We go to Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem, the city which had wall, walls and on its foundation, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, that's Matthias. So why is it that Peter is mentioned 39 times and Matthias is never mentioned? It's simply this. It's the same in church life today. There are those that are in the forefront the Peters, people like myself that take a more public role in preaching and teaching and other ministries, but there are the Matthiases behind the scenes. And was Peter more important than Matthias? No, he had just a different role. And I thank God every day for the Matthiases in Bucky Baptist Church. Because if the Matthiases weren't here, we wouldn't have a service this morning. It's God's plan. And that's the end of that chapter. As John Stott says, the stage is set. And the stage is set for, as for the Holy Spirit coming, the beginning of the church. And as Tom Holland in his book on religions, he, is, he writes very favorably about Christianity. I read him a lot. He speaks here of Acts, the beginning of Acts, as the primarily, primary explosion of Christianity. And that's what we have here. What we're going to come into in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came is the primary explosion of Christianity. And how did it all begin? It began with 120 committed, devoted people that loved the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Have we that desire, maybe today for us all, for God to do the great things from Acts chapter 2 on, he needed people that were committed. And if God is going to do great things that I believe he will in this community, we're not lying down to Satan's um, Captain, the way he's captain, a capturing and people are held captive to Satan. We believe in the power of the gospel. And we believe in the power of prayer that will see a great deliverance. But it takes commitment. And maybe today for us all, we need to say, Lord, restore that joy. Maybe we need to say, Lord, renew that love for you. Maybe we need to reignite our prayer life and our Bible study. Maybe we need to be stirred from the apathy that we're just going on very apathetic in our Christian life. So as the hymn says, set us afire, Lord, stir us, we pray. While the world perishes, we go our way. Purposeless, passionless, day after day, set us afire, Lord. Stir us, we pray. One final thing, just two minutes past Brian last week, is the final thing is I've emphasized listening to God, I've emphasized prayer from this passage. I have mentioned Peter, I have mentioned Matthias, I have mentioned Joseph. I finish with Judas. 28 times Judas is mentioned in the New Testament. 
If you have a Bible open, read the last thing that's said about Judas in the end of verse 25. I left it for the very end from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Judas, by his actions, went to his own place. And this place is called hell. The Bible is quite clear. Judas chose this. How sobering the last thing to be said about Judas in the Bible. That he turned aside to go to his own place. How many have been so close? How many have been in churches? Have been in, I remember so many different conversations. Been in eldership. Been in positions in churches. Came every Sunday. And yet were never born again. Never repented of their sins and came to trust in the one remedy for sin. And that is the precious blood of Christ. Nothing else. Judas was so close. Touching distance. And yet Judas went to his own place, went to hell. When we were in Edinburgh, I was sitting in this restaurant, Pizza Express, it's great, the Tesco vouchers were sitting there, and I never liked to corner a waiter or a waitress on their own, and there was five of us at the table, well three of the family had to leave sharp at the very end, and then Elizabeth had to go to the place, and I was left on my own. And the waitress came, I called her over and she came, and she stood I says, have you got just one minute? She says, yes. I says, do you believe in God? I felt really sorry for her because she stood there and she started to blush. I said, do you go to church? She said, sometimes. I just mentioned about the Lord Jesus to her. She stood motionless. I never received an answer yet. I bid her good night and left. I don't know. She never answered. Can I ask every single person here today? Do you believe in God? Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Every one of you, you'll either have to say yes. Or you say no. You can be silent. But silent means no. And maybe today God is speaking you on Tuesday. The phone bleeped. Somebody I was at school with. 55. In Cullen. Just in a moment. Gone. Spoke to him in the golf course. Spoke to him in Cullen. Just in a moment, a life ended. Just in a moment, our lives can end. Just a moment. Just a moment, and then it's eternity. Our life's just like a vapor. Here for a moment, and then gone. Bow our heads in prayer. Our oh God today. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work in each one of our hearts, each of us that have heard your word. Pray that if there is someone here that has been coming to church, like Judas, a great opportunity. Lord, would you save them this morning? 
Lord Jesus, someone who maybe feels that they've grown cold and they've drifted from you and they've maybe forgotten about you, Lord Jesus, would they be restored today? Lord Jesus, for each one of us, we confess before you it's a struggle. We do. I cannot hide from those listening. We're all the same, Lord. We want to live. We want to do our best. There's times we just know we don't live up to what you desire of us. But Lord Jesus, help us to surrender and live our lives totally and fully for you. Our God, today we thank you for that, what we have read in your word. And I pray that you will remind us, as you have reminded us this morning, of the importance of scripture and the importance of prayer. And I pray for this church in Bucky Baptist. And I pray for the leadership that you will help us, our God, to be a church that are not simply committees gathering to discuss, but we are gathering to pray and find out your mind and your will and listen to you. God, to you be the glory. We worship you and we praise you. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.